Good morning and welcome to worship on this Sunday, the 4th of July, 2021. Love also to our American friends, as it is also Independence Day, and we pray that you have a blessed day as well. We shout out to Pastor Adam and his family. Hope you're all keeping well, and I look forward to introducing you at some time to Moncrief family here as well. But I do hope that all our American friends are having a great day. It's also thank you day. So let me take this opportunity to say thank you to you for joining with us, whether in person or online. You are very welcome and it's lovely to share worship with you. We are starting our summer series, which is often an opportunity to look at lesser known parts of scripture or to explore themes that we might not have an opportunity to do in between all the major festivals between kind of October and March, April time. This summer, I've chosen Unlikely Heroes, the power season. And these are characters who don't readily appear to be heroes, but something about their everyday lives, the actions that they take, cause something wonderful to happen. And so we're gonna explore some characters, some that you might recognize and others that you've maybe not come across in your reading. We are reminded by these folks that our everyday actions, our daily lives are witnesses to God and to his love, his mercy, his wisdom and his provision. If you want a sneaky peek at the list, then we've made it available on the website and you can have a look and see if one of your favourites is maybe tucked in there. Today, we're going to explore the story of Mephibosheth or Mephibosheth under the heading of power and promise. Next week, we're going to look at power and pride. And each one has a power and P something word uh, as its title. If you want to wait till the box set comes out at the end of the summer, you'll need to wait till almost the end of August for that. Today, we're thinking about promise. Our promises, God's promises, do we keep our promises? And what does it mean to know that you are part of God's promise? I wonder if you are somebody who promises the earth and doesn't really give it. I wonder if you're that kind of person who promises to turn up and everybody says that you'll get round to it eventually. Or if you are somebody who says, I promise, and you keep your word. It's quite important to think about what does the word promise mean to you as you go through today's worship. God promised to save us, to have a plan to reunite us in a full relationship with him. And so it is found in Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, we read this verse in verse 12 of chapter 4. Salvation is to be found through him alone, that is Jesus Christ. Salvation is to be found through him alone in all the world. There is no one else whom God has given who can save us. So in a spirit of worship and remembering that we are part of an eternal promise, we're going to share together in a song that reminds us of that promise made and given and completed in Christ. I will sing the wondrous story of the Lord who died for me.
We come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Faithful God, in you we place our trust, you who hold us in your everlasting arms. You are our calm centre in the storm, gathering us like a hen gathers her chicks. And as summer blooms around us, we rest in your holy presence. We praise your holy name and thank you for the blessings of this past week. So for a moment, we cast an eye back over our week and offer gratitude for the many blessings, some so small we may have overlooked them. We thank you for family and friends finally able to come closer. We thank you for sunshine and warmth, the sound and scent of nature, for the call of neighbour over wall or fence the laughter of children at play and the possible promise of holiday, rest and relaxation. And yet, Lord, we know that there are moments that we are sorry for, when our temper got the better of us, when we got our work-leisure balance out of kilter, when we lost focus, or when our words, actions, or timekeeping hurt others. When our promises were not worth the paper they were written upon. Forgive us, Lord, for our selfish actions and soften our hearts and open our minds, we pray. Help us make and keep promises that bless you, bless others, and bless us. Restore us in your goodness and cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, as you yourself promise in your holy word. As we gather in worship, guide and encourage us, we pray, and may all that happens bring you glory and honour. In your name we pray, and with your words that have come through time to us and will go in time beyond us, we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. woven into today's material is the fact that we are all welcome at God's table because of the fulfilled promise of the Messiah. So let me introduce you to our first character who found himself unexpectedly at the king's table, not through his own worth per se, but that of his father and of a promise made. Mephit Vushet is the son of Jonathan. Jonathan was the son of King Saul and his best friend was David. Jonathan and David loved one another dearly and were closer even perhaps than brothers. However, in almost Shakespearean style, they were destined to be kept apart. God had appointed David to succeed King Saul as the king of Israel, chosen via the prophet Samuel. David rose to fame through the slaying of Goliath and was for a time a muse and a musician for King Saul. 
However, Saul struggled with great jealousy and David ended up running for his life. Jonathan, however, knew his dad was behaving irrationally and without any jealousy himself, helped David. Despite knowing that his right to the throne would be taken by David, Jonathan was faithful to David and to God's plan. They both promised that whatever happened in the future, they would look out for one another's family. And so it came about that Saul's family was all but wiped out. And in an earlier chapter in 2 Samuel chapter 4, we read about another son of Saul's being murdered in his bed. King David exacted revenge on the ones who killed an innocent man in his bed. And then we read, another descendant of Saul was Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, who was five years old when Saul and Jonathan were killed. When the news about their death came from the city of Jezreel, his nurse picked him up and fled. But she was in such a hurry that she dropped him and he became crippled. And that's really the most that we know about him until we get to today's story. And there's a number of years that pass before David honours his promise to Jonathan. And we're going to read about that just now. Reading from 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 to 13, David and Mephibosheth. One day David asked, Is there anyone left of Saul's family? If there is, I would like to show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. There was a servant of Saul's family named Ziba, and he was told to go to David. Are you Ziba? the king asked. At your service, he answered. The king asked him, Is there anyone left of Saul's family to whom I can show loyalty and kindness as I promised God I would? Ziba answered, There is still one of Jonathan's sons. He's crippled. Where is he? The king asked. At the home of Macher, son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Ziba answered. So King David sent for him. When Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan and grandson of Saul, arrived, He bowed down before David in respect. David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, At your service, sir. Don't be afraid, David replied. I will be kind to you for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will give you back all the land that belonged to your father Saul, and you will always be welcome at my table. Mephibosheth bowed again and said, I am no better than a dead dog, sir. Why should you be good to me? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said, I am giving Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You, your sons and your servants will farm the land for your master Saul's family and bring in the harvest to provide food for them. But Mephibosheth himself will always be guest at my table. Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Ziba answered, I will do everything your majesty commands. So Mephibosheth ate at the king's table, just like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. All the members of Ziba's family became servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem eating all his meals at the king's table. Amen. And Thank you to Suzanne for that reading. Um, his name is not the easiest name to pronounce, and uh, congratulations. It is one of the tricky ones, I guess. But it was a story that I didn't want to miss out just because his name was a little bit tricky for our Scottish accents. Today's story about Jonathan's son is told in the midst of the story of King David, and most of us could reel off something about David's life, but not so much of Jonathan's son. So this is given without editorial comment. It just appears in the midst of David's story, and you're left wondering kind of why. 
Was it to make David look good and kind or was it some kind of political posturing? On today, Independence Day, you know that there's plenty political posturing going on. Here was the winning king showing favour to the last regime in a time when actually you simply eradicated the other. Thankfully, you don't do that with presidents. Indeed, subjects of King David thought that they were doing him a favour by killing off the children of Saul. But perhaps unusually, this wasn't what David wanted. It was normal to completely wipe out your enemy, but not on this occasion. The relationship between Saul and David and their families was quite different. Perhaps even David might be the origin of the statement, don't shoot the messenger. He might not be the origin of it, but the poor soul who actually went to tell him that Saul and Jonathan were dead also ended up dead himself. So please don't shoot the messenger. The authors, too, of David's story are often quite keen to cast him in a negative light. Um, But they don't in this story. They just tell the story. So perhaps it really is just a wee tale of a promise remembered and honoured. But this story also has parallels with our own story as Christians. Now, I'm often careful to try not to read too much into these things and try not to draw too many parallels. And there's always a risk when you do that. But there is something about this story that really does reflect the welcome that we have at our king's table. And we can see reflections of, and that's key key that you know that, it's reflections of Christ and David, God the Father and Jonathan and ourselves in Mephi, as I'm starting to call him that for short. We like nicknames and shortening names in Scotland. So plus I'm worried that I'm going to say his name wrong one of these times going through this. So I've shortened it to Mephi. Mephi Vauchette was certainly a young man by the time he's called in to see David. And he must have been terrified, absolutely terrified. The equivalent would be getting sent to the headmaster's office or the head teacher's office and that fear that that used to evoke. And just imagine that a thousandfold. He, Mephi, was living as off-grid as he could because kings are fickle and he might be assassinated on purpose or by accident, somebody hoping to score points with the king. The fact that he is crippled is perhaps a saving grace or or a silver lining because in the culture of the time, he became a nobody. The estate manager Ziba is not even willing to give him a name and to have a name meant to have an identity. Names were very powerful and what they meant counted. So as a Sarah, I'm a princess. I'm sure you can tell. Mephi's name means from the mouth of shame. Not exactly inspiring, is it? But the family of Saul were shamed in their later history. Yet for whatever reason, Mephi makes it against all odds, but he is now caught. His respect and his willingness to submit to David come from a natural fear. But David is at pains to make him feel welcome. Not only that, but he restores the boy's fortunes at least the land, and put Ziba in the estate manager, which is basically his job, to work for the benefit of this young man. This, I suspect, was a bit of a kick in the teeth to Ziba, but at the same time, he's granted land and security for his 15 sons, unknown number of daughters, and his 20 servants. Mephi, though, had an all-access pass to the royal courts, as David repays a debt to his dearest friend, Jonathan. But the keeping of the promise isn't the bare minimum. Had Jonathan followed his dad to the throne, then Mephi had every chance of following his dad or being at least part of the royal court regardless. Remember, being crippled was because of injury, not birth. Mephi had a lot that he had to work through as well, And we don't know how much of his attitude came from self-preservation. But perhaps he was like his dad, Jonathan, gracious, generous, relieved perhaps to be able to live life without the fear of constantly looking over your shoulder, wondering if somebody would kill you in the name of, of King David. So David went above and beyond 
in the keeping of his promise. He honoured it to its fullest extent. Now, we don't really know much more about Mephi. We know that Machir, who had looked after Mephi, was good to David at a later battle because of his kindness to Mephi. And so what goes around comes around, as we say. I guess what strikes me about this wee story, apart from just the genuine loveliness of it, is the connection that we can make in our own faith journey. Like I said, I can be reluctant to do that, but David is often a prophet of the Messiah, and the Messiah is of David's line. David himself was a human being, flawed, absolutely, and we cannot worship him. But scripture is of God and about him, and there's no doubt that it's interconnected and that there's the power of relationship and the and the power of image and we have to just kind of look a little bit deeper into things. I think that the welcome Mephi gets at David's table reflects the welcome that we get at the table of our Lord. Mephi came cowering, afraid, because David held his very life in his hands. Yet David stretches out a hand in love and tells him to not be afraid. We should come before our Lord trembling, cowering, because he holds our life in his hand. Just as Mephi was physically disabled, emotionally broken and politically worthless, we ourselves have nothing to offer Christ. Yet he offers him, his very self, to us. He welcomes us at his table and through that welcome, the promise made by God, the Father, to have all people come to him is met. We can be afraid to meet God, wonder at what he will do to us. But he invites us, you and me, to sit at his table like an all-access pass to the royal court, to sit and eat with somebody. I mean, that is so intimate. And like Mephi, we're not held prisoner at his mercy. We're not coerced into this relationship. Mephi had his lands restored and they were managed on his behalf. So he is an independent human being with his own income, his own resources, to put it that way. He was independent, but in an all-access-based relationship with his king, as we are with our God. We are able to be dependent on God and yet also dependent on ourselves. There's a relationship there. There's freedom. So yes, we can fully depend on God to meet our needs, but we're also encouraged to live life in all its fullness. We work together in partnership. particularly at this time where we're worrying about the future, not just COVID and pandemics and restrictions, but we're also worrying about economics and and, and everything else that just goes into living in this kind of messed up world at the moment. We might feel as Christians in particular that we are the last of our kind, that we're getting older and somehow the church is going to fall and everything's going to fall apart. We might feel that we are being driven out, eradicated and forgotten about perhaps even, did I say it, assassinated. But God knows that you are there. You are never alone. You're never forgotten about. You're never lost in the system. Sometimes it takes time. Promises take time to be met and fulfilled. David took time to fulfill his promise to Jonathan. There is so much time between the promise of a Messiah and the arrival of the Messiah, and there is so much time between that and the coming again of Jesus. But promises made by God will always be fulfilled. We, we are able to eat at our king's table despite our brokenness. This is the promise of our heavenly father who welcomes us home like a prodigal child, pulls out a seat at the table for the forgotten and curries in with the hurting. Jesus put it best when he told of the shepherd who leaves the 99 and goes looking for one lost sheep. And heaven rejoices over one sinner who needs to repent, the 99 who don't. None of us, even if we feel like a mephi, ostracized, hiding in the slums, 
We are all welcome. None of us are lost. So thank you to Mephi, or to give him his full name, Mephi Fouchette, Mephi Fouchette, for helping us see the welcome that we also have at our King's table. Our communion liturgy says, Come, not because it is I who invite you, come because the Lord himself invites you. Perhaps, like Mephi, you might be pleasantly surprised if you accept that invitation. Thank you to our first unlikely hero for reminding us that there's a place at the table, at the King's table, for all of us. Amen. We share together in a wee reflective song reminding us that Jesus calls us to be with him. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling.
We now have a time of prayer as we think about others and the wider world with some of the prayer from the Church of Scotland weekly worship. Let us dedicate our offering. Let us pray for our world. Let us pray. Eternal God, as Jesus and the early church cared for those in need, we pray for all who suffer and are not cared for, or whom care cannot reach. We pray for the elderly who die alone, the young who are neglected or cruelly treated, young and old whose weaknesses are exploited and sensitivities abused. We pray for all who have grown hopeless and weary as each day is like the last, for those who face hunger and homelessness with no way out, refugees from war and violence to whom no one wants to give a home, those whose lives have been wrecked by conflicts they do not understand and cannot affect or change, hounded by economic and political forces or by the impact of climate change, which take no account of their needs. In this world of so much suffering, we pray too for all who are affluent, comfortable, warm and cared for, who do not care. For those who know what they should do but do not bother. For those who close their eyes and minds and those who simply find other people's troubles and needs a cross they do not wish to bear. We pray for those who do care. Those who accept the pain and disturbance that knowledge brings but do not see what they can do. Those whose consciences are hurts, who want to help but cannot see how. We pray for all who do care, who are willing to go the extra mile time and time again, often at a cost in so many ways. For those who go where trouble, pain and poverty are, risking life and limb, facing danger and fear. Father, as we pray, Increase the depths of love in us and in others who have something to give to the ill, troubled and dying. Thank you that you watch over your children. You know us by name. You understand what we are like. You call us to follow and you accompany us along the path, seeking us out when we stray, keeping a loving eye on what we do. Lead us into your future on the adventure of faith. For Jesus' sake. Living God, accept these offerings we bring to you in a whole variety of ways. Grant that they may go where we can't, that they may reach where we cannot reach, that they may do what we cannot do. Use them to strengthen your church and advance your kingdom, here where we are and far beyond. For Jesus' sake, in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshipping with us today. Next week we're going to look at the story of an enslaved servant girl who opened the way for her master and army commander to receive healing. And all are welcome to join us once again. Our final praise song reminds us that we are renewed and restored by God. I am a new creation, no, no more in condemnation. And in that we can rejoice. Following the song, we have our blessing to close our worship here together. I pray that you have a wonderful week. And if it's a tough week for you, I pray that you know God's peace. We sing together, I am a new creation. I am a new creation.
Let's have all the ladies sing now. I am. All the brothers together. My heart is overflowing. My love just keeps on growing. Here in the grace of God I stand. Everyone together. And as promised, our blessing. God loves you so very, very much. May the past be the beginning of the future for you. May the faith be the beginning of eternity for you. May the way be all the steps that lead you here. And may love be the guide that takes you further. May the God of the past and present and future be the God of today, tomorrow and yesterday. And may we look back to this point in time and know God has been here and leads us on. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.